They came from the heavens. They established cities. They shaped the black-headed people. They brought down the scepter of power. And then they decided to annihilate humanity. But one of the gods disagreed with the decision. So, he broke his oath. To save humanity. What we've seen is merely an introduction to one of the most significant Mesopotamian tablet texts. This text is referred to as the Eridu Genesis. While researching for this video, I was taken aback. I discovered two distinct versions of the Eridu Genesis. One is also known as the Sumerian Flood Story, while the other is solely referred to as the Eridu Genesis. In this video, we will delve into both versions, starting with the Eridu Genesis, the Sumerian Flood Story. The original tablet begins with a powerful statement. I will stop the annihilation of my creatures. The text doesn't make it clear who uttered this phrase. However, drawing from other texts and this one itself, it's likely referring to Enki, the benevolent and wise god, creator of humans. This profound lament expresses concern and sorrow, as well as a clear intent to halt, end, or cease the annihilation process that seems to have already begun. Furthermore, the term, my creatures, conveys a sense of fatherhood and responsibility for the creation of humans, also referred to as the black-headed people, a term the Sumerians used for themselves. The narrative then introduces the names of the Babylonian gods, An or Anu, Enlil, Ea or Enki, and Ninhursag. It states that after they created humans, animals, and royalty descended to earth, the lands were allocated to their rulers. Hence, the world is populated with humans and animals. The deities command the foundation of cities, with Eridu being the first, believed to be the world's ancient city. Each city is entrusted to a deity, setting the precedent of cities having their guardian gods. The narrative hints at the development of water management systems. The story then encounters a gap leaving readers to speculate why the chief gods, An and Enlil, chose to obliterate humanity with a deluge. Unfortunately, in this text, the motive is not clear. The puzzle can only be assembled when we look at other texts, such as the Epic of Atrahasis, where the motive becomes clear. Humanity's overpopulation and noise, which disturb Enlil's peace. To curb this, Enlil dispatches drought, disease, and famine. However, Enki, the deity of intellect and humanity's ally, always provides solutions to counteract these calamities. It's likely that similar events were narrated in the original Sumerian version, with Enki playing a pivotal role. The tale progresses to describe the deities taking a vow, likely to uphold the decision to annihilate humanity. The protagonist, Zudsura, a monarch and cleric from Surapak, emerges. Enki, bound by the oath, indirectly warns Zudsura by speaking to a wall, aware that Zudsura would overhear. The narrative then has another gap, but it's inferred that Zudsura crafts a vast arc, safeguarding animals and human lineage. The story picks up with a portrayal of the torrential rains lasting a week. Once the tempest subsides, the sun deity, Utu, or Utu Shamash, emerges. Zudsura carves an opening in the Ark, allowing the sunlight to penetrate. He then offers a tribute to the deity. The subsequent events are obscured due to missing portions of the text. However, it appears that An and Enlil regret their actions, appreciating Zudsura's efforts to salvage their creations. They bestow upon him the gift of immortality in the paradise of the land of Dilmun. According to the fragments of the tablet, it appears that the narrative extended beyond this apparent ending for an additional 39 lines. However, the specific content of this portion has been lost over time. Context In other videos on our channel, we've had the chance to delve into the history of George Smith. In the video titled, Anunnaki Movie Explained, we noted that George Smith was among the first to decipher some of the most significant cuneiform tablets. He was the pioneer in reading what became known as the Flood Story predating the Bible. On that occasion, 
Smith presented his findings to the Biblical Archaeology Society. The text he translated was titled, The Chaldean Account of the Deluge. His discovery made headlines worldwide, challenging the belief that the Bible was divinely inspired and that God had guided the prophets who penned the world's best-known and best-selling book. Smith's findings became part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, specifically the 11th Tablet, recognized as the oldest literary text in world history. The question that arose at the time was unsettling. How could a work believed to be divinely inspired appear in older documents, yet in a more comprehensive form than the inspired version? It's fascinating to see how traditional science, archaeology, history, and theology approach these topics. The Epic of Gilgamesh is regarded as a literary account, a myth, and the world's oldest literary text. I recall noting this in my notebook during Library Science College when the professor taught the History of Human Records course. In contrast, theology often views biblical records as divinely inspired and the result of cosmic revelation. For centuries, millennia even, the Judeo-Christian religious tradition has dominated. This tradition believes its scriptures are divinely inspired, while others are mere myths. This perspective brings to mind a statement from another video on our channel. God is dead. This video faced criticism from some viewers due to the controversial nature of the statement. However, this phrase was coined by the philosopher Nietzsche. In his view, the death of God isn't physical, but philosophical and anthropological, stemming from technological and scientific advancements. It's the Enlightenment's outcome, the light of reason dispelling the shadows of ignorance that centuries of religious and dogmatic obscurantism cast upon society. This context, although touching on themes discussed in other videos, is crucial. Until Smith's discovery, Many believed the Bible was the world's oldest book, resulting from divine inspiration. But after George Smith's discoveries and his sudden, early, and mysterious illness followed by his death, investigations into the Mesopotamian tablets didn't cease. On the contrary, they continued, unveiling astonishing revelations. Friedrich Nietzsche lived during the time of the Mesopotamian tablet discoveries, However, as far as we know, he wasn't aware of their content. He couldn't have imagined that these tablets, written centuries and millennia before the Hebrew Bible, would challenge the theological and philosophical morality attributed to divine revelation. These tablets offer narratives of biblical events from different perspectives, introducing other deities and moral codes that shaped society at the time, revealing not just one deity, but several. This context sets the stage for the topic of this video. The tablet known as Eridu Genesis, the Sumerian Flood Story, was discovered in 1893 near the ancient city of Nippur by the University of Pennsylvania. Its translation began only in 1912. By the end of this video, we'll delve into the original content of the Mesopotamian tablet. Now, let's focus on another version of the Eridu Genesis available in a recent book, published in 1987 by historian and Assyriologist Thorkild Jacobson. Summary of the Eridu Genesis, translated by Thorkild Jacobson. The tablet describes Nintur's deep contemplation about humanity, seemingly forgotten. The text relates that she remembered her creations and expressed a desire to guide them back to their rightful paths. She envisioned them building cities and places of worship, where she could find solace in their shade. Nintur wished for these cities to be constructed in pure locations, and she also hoped for places of divination to be established in equally pure spots. The narrative mentions that she provided guidelines for purification and pleas for mercy, actions believed to appease divine anger. Furthermore, she perfected the rituals and ceremonies, extending her wish for peace to the surrounding regions. The text recounts that when the gods, namely An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursaga, created the black-headed people, they also brought forth small animals from the earth in abundance. The land was filled with gazelles, wild donkeys, and other four-legged creatures. 
The tablet relates that Nintur desired guidance for her creations, hoping for a leader who would oversee their labor and guide them as cattle are led. As the symbols of royalty, the scepter, crown, and throne descended from the heavens. The king executed divine services with utmost precision. He established cities in pure locations, each named and given specific allocations. The cities, as the text lists, were Eridu, given to Nudimud, Bad Tibira, bestowed upon the prince and the sacred one, Larak, handed to Pabalsag, Sipar, granted to Utu, and Shurapak, given to Ansud. These cities, recognized by their names and allocations, undertook the task of clearing canals blocked with a unique purplish clay, ensuring the flow of water. Their efforts in cleaning the smaller canals resulted in abundant growth. However, the narrative then shifts to a darker tone, with a lost account hinting at the displeasure of the chief god Enlil with humanity's noise. This disturbance led him to rally the Divine Assembly to decide on humanity's destruction through a deluge. The tablet relates that Nintur, deeply saddened, mourned for her creations, and Inanna too was filled with sorrow. However, Enki, instead of succumbing to despair, sought inner counsel. The gods, including An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursaga, made a solemn oath, invoking the names of An and Enlil. During this tumultuous period, Ziusudra reigned as king and served as a lustration priest. The narrative describes him as a visionary, crafting the god of giddiness and showing reverence towards it. As he maintained his vigil, Zeusudra experienced visions that were distinct from dreams. These visions included conversations, oaths, and symbolic gestures involving the gods. The tablet recounts that as Zeusudra continued his observance, he was beckoned to listen closely to a message. The message revealed a forthcoming flood that would engulf the cities and the land. The decision to obliterate mankind was irrevocable as the commands of An and Enlil were immutable. The text hints at the gravity of this decree, emphasizing the unyielding nature of the god's decisions. The narrative then alludes to Enki's counsel to Zeusudra, suggesting the construction of a boat to save living beings. However, the specifics of this advice and Zeusudra's subsequent actions are lost in the text. The tablet continues to relate Enki's urgent counsel to Zeusudra. Tear down the house, build a ship, give up possessions, seek thou life, forswear belongings, keep soul alive. Aboard ship take thou the seed of all living things. That ship thou shalt build, her dimensions shall be to measure. The narrative describes a catastrophic event where all malevolent winds and tempestuous storms converged. With their combined might, a flood swept over the cities of the half-bushel baskets, persisting for seven days and nights. After this deluge had ravaged the land, and the malevolent winds had violently tossed the large vessel upon the vast waters, the sun emerged, casting its radiant light across both the heavens and the earth. Ziusudra, in response to the newfound light, created an opening in the large boat. The valiant Utu, recognizing this act, directed his luminous rays into the vessel's interior. The text relates that Ziusudra, acknowledging Utu's benevolence, approached and paid his respects by kissing the ground. In a gesture of gratitude, the king offered sacrifices, slaughtering oxen and generously providing sheep. He prepared barley cakes and other offerings, burning juniper, a pure mountain plant, in a sacred fire. However, the narrative then hints at a significant event, where Enlil's anger upon discovering survivors is evident. Yet, the specifics of his wrath, and how Enki managed to appease him, are lost in the text. The tablet recounts a solemn oath taken by the gods. They swore by the very breath of life from both heaven and earth, affirming Zeusudra's alliance with them. An and Enlil, in particular, made this sacred vow. The text relates that Zeusudra was entrusted with the responsibility of releasing the small animals that had been preserved from the flood. In a subsequent event, Zeusudra approached An and Enlil, 
once again showing his reverence by kissing the ground before them. The narrative describes that both Anne and Enlil, recognizing Zeusudra's devotion and the role he played in preserving life, bestowed upon him blessings akin to those of the gods. They granted him a life of longevity, similar to that of deities, and a breath of life that would endure. On that significant day, Zeusudra was honored with the title of Preserver, and was recognized as the guardian of the names of the small animals and the lineage of mankind. The text concludes with the gods directing Zeusudra to reside in the east, specifically in Mount Dilmun, where he would live with divine favor. Context of Eridu Genesis, translated by Thorkild Jacobson. Thorkild Jacobson was a historian and a seriologist, as well as a university professor. His contributions are essential for understanding Mesopotamian tablets. The book that contains the translation of the Eridu Genesis is titled The Harps That Once, Sumerian Poetry in Translation. From this title alone, we can discern the traditional scientific approach to Mesopotamian texts as Sumerian poetry. It's deeply unsettling to realize that the latest archaeological and historical discoveries about our distant past are treated this way by mainstream science. The Anunnaki Ancient Mystery Channel aims to be a serious channel, delivering quality and trustworthy information. However, we aren't bound by scientific obligations, nor do we need to adhere to the conventions observed by traditional history and science. We can challenge the perspectives of archaeology and science, confronting theological interpretations in pursuit of the truth. If you closely examine the foundations of our current society, especially in the context of Western civilization, it becomes evident that teaching methods are largely overseen by religious institutions. Thus, we shouldn't be naive enough to overlook that many significant discoveries and correlations get lost in the hallways of universities and scientific academies worldwide. It's crucial to challenge this status quo, not only by disseminating this content, but also by encouraging institutions and researchers to break this complacency in the face of a storm of new revelations. Winds of change are essential. Zechariah Sitchin did precisely this in his books. Eric von Daniken followed a similar path. Graham Hancock gained popularity with the Ancient Apocalypse series on Netflix. Mauro Biglino, a former biblical translator, also challenged the traditional view of Judeo-Christian theology. They are not alone in this endeavor, and neither are we. We are also making our mark here. In 1981, Thorkild Jacobson published an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature, which not only contained the content of the Eridu Genesis, but also his analysis. Based on his analysis and other complementary knowledge regarding Jacobson's article, we will now undertake a comparative interpretation between the text of the Eridu Genesis and the Hebrew Bible. The Eridu Genesis and the Hebrew Bible the ancient Eridu Genesis shares remarkable parallels with the biblical creation story. Both narratives unfold in three distinct sections, the creation of mankind and animals, a list of significant figures post-creation, with city leaders and their reign durations in Mesopotamia, and patriarchs with their lifespans in the Bible, and the flood event. Instead of centering these tales around a singular hero, as seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh, both stories sequence events chronologically. The Eridu Genesis presents a clear cause and effect relationship, tracing the journey from nature to civilization and then to the flood. This linear progression is noteworthy, resembling a historian's approach, leading us to categorize these tales as mytho-historical. Another intriguing similarity is the emphasis on chronology in both accounts. Precise durations, whether reigns or lifespans, are provided, and these figures are notably large. This focus on specific durations is unusual for myths, which typically exist in a timeless realm. Such an interest in chronology is more aligned with historical records. 
The Eridu Genesis seems to draw inspiration from the Sumerian king list, evident in its language and style. The Bible's chronology, on the other hand, is attributed to an author from around 500 BC. Interestingly, the Eridu Genesis was still recognized in Mesopotamia around 600 BC, as evidenced by a fragment from Ashurbanipal's library and properly attested by Jacobson in his referred scientific article. While the biblical narrative appears to echo older Mesopotamian texts, it's essential to recognize the significant transformations in the biblical version, which shifts the original's essence. The Eridu Genesis adopts a positive outlook on life, emphasizing progress. In contrast, the biblical account starts with perfection, deteriorating due to human sin, culminating in the flood, sparing only the righteous Noah. We find echoes of perversion and corruption of the earth, with the blame for divine wrath always falling upon humans. This moral dimension and the resultant pessimistic perspective starkly contrast with the Sumerian tale's tone. Both stories, however, assure that such a flood won't happen again. Myths, being fluid, can adopt various meanings based on context. Hence, interpreting them requires caution. Furthermore, the notion of human guilt differs between the two. In the Eridu Genesis, humans simply existed without corrupting creation. In the Bible, humanity's corruption leads to the flood, with only Noah deemed worthy of salvation. Recognizing this distinction helps us understand our inherent value as creations of the divine. Now that we understand and have conducted the necessary analyses, we will reproduce the original translations of the texts. Eridu Genesis, the Sumerian Flood Story I will stop the annihilation of my creatures, and I will return the people from their dwelling grounds. Let them build many cities so that I can refresh myself in their shade. Let them lay the bricks of many cities in pure places. Let them establish places of divination in pure places. And when the fire quenching is arranged, the divine rites and exalted powers are perfected and the earth is irrigated, I will establish well-being there. After An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursag had fashioned the black-headed people, they also made animals multiply everywhere and made herds of four-legged animals exist on the plains, as is befitting. Here, there are approximately 32 lines missing. I will oversee their labor. Let the builder of the land dig a solid foundation. After the of kingship had descended from heaven, after the exalted crown and throne of kingship had descended from heaven, the divine rights and the exalted powers were perfected. The bricks of the cities were laid in holy places, their names were announced, and the were distributed. The first of the cities, Eridu, was given to Nudimud, the leader. The second, Bad Tibira, was given to the mistress. The third, Larag, was given to Pabalsag. The fourth, Zimbir, was given to Hiro Utu. The fifth, Surapag, was given to Sud. And after the names of these cities had been announced and the had been distributed, the river was watered. Here there are approximately 34 lines missing. Seat in heaven, flood, mankind. So he made, then Nintud. Holy Inanna made a lament for its people. Enki took counsel with himself. En Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursag made all the gods of heaven and earth take an oath invoking An and Enlil. In those days, Zudsura the king, the Gudug priest, he fashioned, the humble, committed, reverent, day by day, standing constantly at something that was not a dream appeared, conversation, taking an oath by invoking heaven and earth. In the Kaiur, the gods, a wall, Zudsura, standing at its side, heard, Sidewall standing at my left side, sidewall, I will speak words to you, take heed of my words, pay attention to my instructions. A flood will sweep over the, in all the, a decision that the seed of mankind is to be destroyed has been made. The verdict, the word of the divine assembly, cannot be revoked. The order announced by An and Enlil cannot be overturned. Their kingship, their term has been cut off, their heart should be rested about this. Here there are approximately 38 lines missing. All the windstorms and gales rose together, and the flood swept over the land. After the flood had swept over the land, and waves and windstorms had rocked the huge boat for seven days and seven nights, Utu, the sun god, came out, illuminating heaven and earth. Zudsura could drill an opening in the huge boat, and hero Utu entered the huge boat with his rays. 
Zudsura the king prostrated himself before Utu. The king sacrificed oxen and offered innumerable sheep. Here there are approximately 33 lines missing. They have made you swear by heaven and earth. An and Enlil have made you swear by heaven and earth. More and more animals disembarked onto the earth. Judsura the king prostrated himself before An and Enlil. An and Enlil treated Judsura kindly. They granted him life like a god. They brought down to him eternal life. At that time, because of preserving the animals and the seed of mankind, they settled Zudsura the king in an overseas country, in the land of Dilmun, where the sun rises. Here there are approximately 39 lines missing. Eridu Genesis, translated by Thorkild Jacobson. Nintur was paying attention. Let me bethink myself of my humankind, all forgotten as they are, and mindful of mine, Nintur's creatures let me bring them back, let me lead the people back from their trails. May they come and build cities and cult places that I may cool myself in their shade. May they lay the bricks for the cult cities in pure spots, and may they found places for divination in pure spots. She gave directions for purification and cries for clemency. The things that cool divine wrath, perfected the divine service and the august offices, said to the surrounding regions, let me institute peace there. When An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursaga fashioned the dark-headed people they had made the small animals that come up from out of the earth, come from the earth in abundance, and had let there be, as it befits it, gazelles, wild donkeys, and four-footed beasts in the desert. And let me have him advise. Let me have him oversee their labor, and let him teach the nation to follow along unerringly like cattle. When the royal scepter was coming down from heaven, the august crown and the royal throne being already down from heaven, he, the king, regularly performed to perfection the august divine services and offices, laid the bricks of those cities in pure spots. They were named by name and allotted half-bushel baskets. The firstling of those cities, Eridu, she gave to the leader Nudimud, the second, Bad Tibira. She gave to the prince and the sacred one, the third, Larak. She gave to Pabulsag, the fourth, Sipar, she gave to the gallant Utu. The fifth, Shurupak, she gave to Ansud. These cities, which had been named by names and had been allotted half-bushel baskets, dredged the canals, which were blocked with purplish wind-borne clay, and they carried water. Their cleaning of the smaller canals established abundant growth, lost account of the antediluvian rulers, and how human noise vexed the chief god Enlil so much that he persuaded the divine assembly to vote the destruction of man by the deluge. That day, Ninter wept over her creatures, and holy Inanna was full of grief over their people. But Enki took counsel with his own heart. An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursaga had the gods of heaven and earth swear by the names of An and Enlil. At that time, Zeusudra was king and lustration priest. He fashioned, being a seer, the god of giddiness and stood in awe beside it, wording his wishes humbly. As he stood there regularly day after day, Something that was not a dream was appearing. Conversation, a swearing of oaths by heaven and earth, a touching of throats, and the gods bringing their thwarts up to cure. And as Yusudra stood there beside it, he went on hearing, Step up to the wall to my left and listen. Let me speak a word to you at the wall, and may you grasp what I say. May you heed my advice. By our hand, a flood will sweep over the cities of the half-bushel baskets and the country, the decision that mankind is to be destroyed has been made. A verdict, a command of the assembly cannot be revoked. An order of An and Enlil is not known ever to have been countermanded. Their kingship, their term, has been uprooted. They must bethink themselves of that. Now, what I have to say to you. Lost account of Enki's advice to build a boat and load it with pairs of living things, and Zeusudra's compliance. All the evil winds, all stormy winds gathered into one and with them, then, the flood was sweeping over the cities of the half-bushel baskets for seven days and seven nights. After the flood had swept over the country, after the evil wind had tossed the big boat about on the great waters, the sun came out spreading light over heaven and earth. Zusudra then drilled an opening in the big boat, and the gallant Utu sent his light into the interior of the big boat. Zusudra, being king, stepped up before Utu kissing the ground before him. The king was butchering oxen was being lavish with the sheep barley cakes, crescents together with. He was crumbling for him juniper, the pure plant of the mountains. He filled on the fire and with a clasped to the breast, he 
lost account of Enlil's wrath at finding survivors and his mollification by Enki. You here have sworn by the life's breath of heaven, the life's breath of earth, that he verily is allied with yourself. You there, Anne and Enlil, have sworn by the life's breath of heaven, the life's breath of earth, that he is allied with all of you. He will disembark the small animals that come up from the earth. Ziusudra, being king, stepped up before An and Enlil kissing the ground. And An and Enlil, after honoring him, were granting him life like a god's, were making lasting breath of life, like a god's, descend into him. That day they made Ziusudra, preserver, as king, of the name of the small animals and the seed of mankind, live toward the east over the mountains in Mount Dilmun. 